So, what do you do when your clients don't change? That's the topic of this particular video. I started out seeing clients in 1998 as a curious, somewhat arrogant, playful 21-year-old kid. I'd done six weeks of NLP training and, and some hypnosis training. And I was in for a rude awakening. You see, I was fascinated by the impossibles practice of Milton Erickson, John Grinder, and Richard Bandler. So I started putting ads in big newspapers looking for clients who had not succeeded in traditional therapy. I was looking for impossible or difficult clients. And I offered to work with them with a no change, no pay guarantee. Now let me tell you, that's a great way to go broke. But it also has the perfect incentive structure to force you to learn something new and to update your game. One of the things that I discovered was that getting results in actual client work, lasting results, was a lot more difficult than it looked like on stage at NLP and hypnosis seminars. And one reason for that was because a good trainer knows how to select the right demo subject. They're looking for people who have good felt sense, who have good access to their feelings, who can visualize well in consciousness, who are good at absorption. But, and who can blame them? Because as a trainer, you have to demonstrate what you're supposed to demonstrate. But what happened is that when I got home, I started getting all the clients that any trainer would avoid like the plague. People who don't have access to that nonverbal felt sense of their issue, who can't imagine something in the office and get in touch with the feelings. I'm not the first guy to discover this. In 1978, a guy by the name of Eugene Gendlin, an American psychologist, published a book called Focusing. And Eugene Gendlin asked a different question than many others asked at the time. Instead of asking what form of therapy works the best, he would ask what clients tend to succeed the best in therapy. And what he discovered to be the main factor, of course there are many factors, but the main factor was, does the client have that nonverbal felt sense? of their issue when they are in the therapist's office and can they voluntarily access it? You see, here's the thing. If you look at the NLP techniques that you may have learned, whether it's a swish pattern, a compulsion blowout, a VK dissociation or a phobia cure, or you're doing hypnotherapy and you rely on, whether it's part work, idiomotor signaling, regression work, uh, imagining new behaviors, all of these procedures rely on see-feel, hear-feel circuits. They rely on your clients having the ability to have that felt sense. If they don't, you're essentially screwed. So what I had to learn to do was to work with people who did not have that felt sense. And no, none of my NLP or hypnosis trainers ever taught me how to do that. So you either then have to be able to help your client to develop it, or you have to rely on other ways of working that does not require it to begin with. And those are typically outside of the traditional NLP and hypnosis box. Something else that's problematic with the seminar culture is that I discovered that a lot of the people who uh, seem to get dramatic results on stage in seminars are people with high hypnotic capacity. They work great for good demos because they're so expressive and they're so good at absorption and getting into states. 
But one of the things that we know with highly hypnotizable clients is that high hypnotizability or high hypnotic capacity is a double-edged sword. One of the drawbacks is that results can often be very easy come, easy go. So they can so un easily, uncritically step into a new suggested reality, but when they hit the doctor's office or they're back into their regular cultural surround, they may just as easily step into that reality as if they had never stepped in a foot inside your office. None of the hypnosis or NLP courses I attended taught me anything about the double-edged sword that is high hypnotic capacity either. So, in my 26th year of change work and having spent the first eight running this impossibles practice, I've designed a new seminar which is titled when clients don't change. How do you work with the living dead, the people who don't have that felt sense? How do you help them develop it or work around it? How do you deal with the highly hypnotizable ones? What do you do when people relapse or uh, don't respond in the typical ways? Uh, that's the topic of my seminar. How do you manage expectations? How do you set the frame? Milton Erickson used to say, we provide the weather, we create the learning contest. But, but how do you do that and adapt it to the particular client that you're seeing? So I'll give an example of this. A lot of hypnotists and NLP folks in particular kind of play the confidence game where they emphasize speed and they more or less promise quick and dramatic results or have a lot of confidence about getting the results. But after a session, your client may have one out of four responses. A, complete resolution of whatever issue they came for. B, change might be a lot of change, medium change, small change. Might also be no change, might also be worse. They've actually increased their symptoms. If you play the confidence game and you don't get either significant change or at least some change or a full resolution, you've probably lost all credibility. So how do you manage expectations so that people are likely to change, but you still have credibility if they don't immediately change or if they actually increase their symptoms initially. So if this resonates with you and you're curious, uh, know that this is an online course. It lasts for seven weeks. It's one, uh, it's 90 minutes once a week. We start on uh, May 23rd, 2023, and we end on July 4th. So go to provocativehypnosis.com and the seminar page, and you'll find the link with all the information. And I really hope to see you there. It will make you a better therapist, a better coach, I promise. So thanks for listening, and hopefully I'll see you there.